Okay, it's working. That's fine. We're back. All right, we're back. Um, Allah has blessed us with another bountiful docket. <laughs> Indeed, yeah. Big day on the on the TL. Yeah. I and work. I was so bored just a couple of days ago. I know, I know. And then we woke up to Lana Del Rey. Yeah. The queen Making. of it all. <laughs> Thank God. Our cup runneth over. <laughs> I was stoked, personally, mm-hmm. to hear from her. Uh, I'm actually, I'm stoked because we don't have to address the elephant in the room, which is Gia Gate. I'm very relieved about that. I'm not yeah. ready for that yet. We'll, we'll, we'll get back to it. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I think, you know... <laughs> I'll just say that I wasn't even going to say anything if yeah. she hadn't have said anything. And if she hadn't have dragged our subreddit into it, leave I those know. mentally ill people alone. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I, the subreddit is not for you, Gia. It's, I, don't, I don't know what a, what a pure and wholesome girl like that is even doing on our subreddit. Mm. Like I said, I don't, I don't care who your parents are, what they did. And I don't mm-hmm. care, and I don't like that it's being used uh, to act as a negative reflection on you. Um, what I want to know is, what is a pregnant woman doing, <laughs> browsing our subreddit, <laughs> like any subreddit, but especially ours, unless it's like literally a subreddit dedicated to like breast pumping tips and tricks. That's the I only mean, acceptable name searching. I know putting that kind of umbilical psychic stress on a fetus must be. <laughs> I know. It's like literally what I tweeted, like putting the fucking, it's like listen, going on our subreddit is basically like uh, the opposite of putting headphones on your baby bump and listening to like Mozart or like educational programs. Like you're going to give your child birth defects or you're autism. You're going to give them brain, brain damage. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that poor They're going to get whatever is wrong with Bluebird. Or <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the baby's going to come out a pog with like, that looks like ScarJo. <laughs> No. I bet you had a white baby. We'll get back to it. Yeah, we will. (laughs) There's more to say. I just, uh, unironically, congratulations on the baby. I hope it comes out happy and healthy. Yeah. With a huge ass (laughs) and massive oily tits. Stop it. Are you drunk already, Anna? No, no, I just started. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be like the call her daddy girls. Um, Oh my God, girl. (laughs) We'll talk about them yeah, too. We're gonna, so, so Lana, Lana posted on uh, an Instagram that she seemed to have written on a typewriter and then scanned, <laughs> called "Question for the Culture." Uh-huh. Uh, now that Doja Cat, Ariana, Camilla, Cardi B, Kalani, and Nicki Minaj and Beyonce have had number ones with songs about being sexy, wearing no clothes, fucking, cheating, etc. Can I please go back to singing about being embodied, feeling beautiful by being in love, even if the relationship is not perfect, or dancing for money, or whatever I want, without being crucified or saying that I'm glamorizing abuse? Question mark, question mark, question yeah, mark. Yeah, etc. She goes on to say that she's not... She doesn't glamorize abuse. She's just, in reality, just a glamorous person singing. I think she should have left it at, I'm just a glamorous person singing. I know. No, I know. That sentence was (laughs) so That's all she had to say. That that sentence was so good and so tight and so stylistically enviable until she was like, there are prevalent reasons for emotionally abusive relationships (laughs) to exist across cultures. I was like, bitch, don't get intersectional. Just leave it. Just say you're horny for your daddy. Yeah. Just, and you want to be a good, crazy baby girl for him <laughs> on the boulevard later and be small and uh, wild and free and all the other, and nighttime with your daddy. It's, <laughs> in your red dress and high heel pump shoes. <laughs> yeah. In your Betty Boop ass voice. It's great. You've, you've got a I have stand you since day one, ever since I saw your weird stiff performance on SNL I was like <laughs> this finally like a pop star for people with low serotonin <laughs> who uh, it means everything to them to be in love yeah <laughs> and Amber said this in our group checks but yeah it's like empowerment doesn't make good 
music good love no, songs good it's, pop music it's made music so bad this is like my polemic that i've repeated a million times like uh girl groups of the 60s were better in this regard than like songstresses of the 2000s because they all of their songs were like i need you i'm desperate for you please yeah. come to my window and rape me men and, and, now, and men are and like i'll do anything for you to have you in my life i'll yeah. give it all up i'll humiliate myself and now everything is like i don't need a man i have my own <laughs> depop shop <laughs> It's like so I'm wearing tearaway cargo pants. It's so bad. <laughs> totally. I mean not to quote literally high fidelity, but <laughs> in that book screenplay movie, like the sentiment the first like sentence in that book I think is like well, am I depressed because I listen to pop music or do I listen to pop music because I'm depressed like yeah good question Masters music House should be Masters melancholy schools. yeah it especially should least... loves like love being in love is pathetic and humiliating yeah it sucks everybody's like oh you should enjoy being in love and I'm like no it sucks it's like harrowing and nerve wracking at the beginning and then it's like uh depressing and like nihilistic at the end but she's like she said she was like fed up with um quote female writers and alt singers okay for, Interesting. for accusing her of glamorizing abuse yeah i mean it's very relatable you know because i feel like she's quarantined obviously she's yeah. probably name searching she's probably yeah. feeling pretty attacked but, like, as someone who is in a Lana echo chamber, essentially, like, I only associate, really, with Lana fans. I don't read music writing. I know that she, like, Ugh, gets upset no. about critics. But, like, yeah. I don't read. I'm not going to read or review unless I'm doing research for the pod or something. I don't really care. So, like, to me, it seems like no one's impeding her at all in glamorizing abuse or whatever she yeah. perceives like yeah, the problem is the, the fags and the hags love her we don't care girl lana darling they're mad at me for uh <laughs> quoting you they're not mad at you i mean and she then that's not even her an ori a lana original she's Who quoting like that? some girl some girls Gandhi. <laughs> Hit me and it felt like a kiss. As Mao said, he hit me and it felt like a kiss. Karl Marx. <laughs> if mm. Karl Marx had lyrics like Lana Del Rey, I would call myself a proud card carrying socialist. <laughs> I would join the DSA. She's a genius. And then she plugs her poetry book at the end. And her album, is, yeah. I will be also be reading, and I'm so excited there's going to be a new album. Me I think too. Jack Antonoff did a really great job on Norman fucking Rockwell. On breaking up with Lena Dunham. I'm no, sorry. Anna, no, horrible. you have to cut that out. I have to. I, <laughs> I'll make you. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a Lena stan now. Um, I've been silenced. Um, but... <laughs> But, like, I don't know. I was like, Lana, who's saying this about you? Like, some some chubby, ginger, British male, like, some art writer, writer with man boobs who looks like El Sh uh, Ed Sheeran? Like, who's saying this about you? Somebody who writes for 33 and a third? I mean, I think you... I'm sure, like, since her career, she is right in a way. And, of course, everyone, like, is ready to jump down her throat for talking about POCs like Ariana Grande um, <laughs> you know and like making doing white fragility or whatever mm -hmm. but she is singular in a way in that she is kind of the only person crooning about love in an abject way like that yes yeah even if you in, say in pop music. oh it's just branding and marketing she's the only one with that brand mm-hmm no so one I'm wants sure, to touch like, that brand. From the outset, she's ha she has had backlash from female writers. I'm sure, yeah, about like being trad or whatever. The same kind of flavor of conversation that like people have about us. And yeah, this is like this is a thing that like fucking modern liberal individual mindsets cannot fathom. Uh, description does not equal endorsement. Like merely stating a reality does not equal glamorizing it like right. 
she's not she's right she's not glamorizing anything she's just a glamorous bitch with a glamorous aesthetic well, I tweeted months ago that I'm not glamorizing anorexia. I'm just glamorous and anorexic. Yeah. It's like it's, the, the, there's no like uh, causality or whatever. And like, I think they're just jealous because she's like cool and not woke and her own woman um, without being branded as this kind of like go getter girl boss. And most of all, I feel like they resent her for saying things that they themselves have felt but have been brainwashed into not acknowledging. They're in denial. Right. Feminism is all about being in denial. It's true. I watched that uh, Donahue Palia oh, Flutie yeah. thing. Wow. Why don't we have TV like that anymore? I know. I know. That's the thing. It's like all the That's same. That's what people want. I want to see a fucking talk show with people <laughs> with two hot arguing. chicks sparring. Yeah. yeah. I like how he was like a wormy little male ally. I know. He's kind of playing both sides in this. He's good. Donna, he's a good host. He knows how to, like, trigger people. Isn't he the one that got um, bumped from his job for protesting the Iraq war? I think he got fired. I'm pretty Did sure. He? I think that it, it's that Donahue. I don't know. I, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm pretty sure. Um, but, yeah. I'm not going to fact check that. I'm just going to believe it. Yeah, I, I'm I not either. Yeah. I've already made the decision. <laughs> um, the the call me daddy girls have have emboldened me to be further more uninformed <laughs> and retarded. I I'm serious. It's true. Me too. Um, but like, I find them very inspiring. Actually, me too. Me too. I bet you thought we were going to come out with some catty bullshit, but mm-hmm. there's nothing but love and support on this pod. <laughs> um, but like. It's funny because we're literally retreading the same old battles, you know? Yeah. But, like, at a lower level of discourse, like, people are like, well, uh, no one can read anymore, like, blah, blah, blah. It's like, yeah, people can read, but they have no comprehension. And it makes me think that mass literacy was a mistake because people were better off when they just couldn't like, read straight up. Couldn't understand it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a very hot take, but you're, I don't think you're wrong. And now they see like the words on the page, but they don't, there's no logical they can't relationship interpret them between correctly. them. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. I like the moment in the Faludi thing where she's talking about, they have this whole thing of, well, Palia does her thing about how men build the bridges and yeah, stuff. Yeah, she's, and she's like James like, Brown. Man, she- made the car. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> and Faludi's like, women have invented lots of stuff, like the ironing board and, 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 like, <laughs> she can't think of another thing that a woman's invented. Yeah, yeah. And ironing boards suck. Yeah, they like, suck. They're really Get poorly steamer, designed. Bitch. <laughs> They're so hard to fold back up. It's always like it's nothing stresses me out more than having to like fold an ironing board back up. It's I <laughs> a woman clear a very confused woman clearly clearly like you have this thing a- in your house that's like the size and weight of a dead body. You have to shift it around <laughs> yeah. the apartment. <laughs> Who yeah. invented dry cleaning? Korean people? Yeah, not women. It's not women. <laughs> The steamer probably was invented by a man. Probably to appease women. (laughs) Because they were complaining about their ironing port so damn much. Because they were going (laughs) to their, like, luncheons and balls and didn't want wrinkles in their clothes. (laughs) But but Lana Lana's not even, like, trad. I mean, she is in a... She's probably conservative in various ways. I understand her boyfriend's a cop or whatever. I thought they were Which is probably... I mean, maybe they did. I don't know. I don't really care about her personal life. Yeah, I don't either. I'm like... I've opted into the persona that she's presenting as an artist. And that's like what people are talking about when they accuse her of being trad. And she's not. She's just romantic. Yeah. She's like... Yeah, she... that's true. I don't really care to arbitrate her personal views, which are probably like deeply racist and conservative. She's from Long Island. I don't know. Yeah, it makes sense that she. Yeah, <laughs> but it's nice to sort see, of conservative. It's nice to see her like coming around to what we've been preaching all along, which is that feminism has sold women a bill of lies. <laughs> I and, know. I'm really thinking it more and more these days. Well, of, and they did it with our total mean- consent. I know. You just wanna... how meaning, how meaningless it is. Yeah. And how it's just led us down the wrong 
path for so long. Yeah, no, I, I was know. I was thinking about this because she talks about basically like, well, um, with all the topics that women are allowed to sing about these days, I resent being billed as like a hysteric for not putting on a happy face at all times. And mm-hmm. I was like, I was like, silly rabbit, you know, like the only topics that women are allowed to talk about are like fucking uh, the ones where they get to rebrand their atomization and alienation as a good thing for their purchasing power. Like uh, this, right. I don't need a man. I'm a boss bitch sort of right. thing. Right. And hers is just, it's melancholy. It's melancholic pop music. It's like, it'd be like getting mad at the weekend for like glamorizing drug addiction. <laughs> okay. like, yeah. yeah, like what are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. And it's and like when being so fucked up that you're the real you. <laughs> <laughs> um, but like, you're, the thing is like she's not just melancholic she's also like defiantly melancholic mm-hmm. like she owns her melancholy you're not allowed to show weakness anymore unless you explicitly identify as a victim right and then go through like the, the five stages of like whatever anger and grief and whatever and come <laughs> out a survivor exactly and she's you like can't... I'm not a victim or a survivor I just, I'm wallowing I'm yeah. hey I'm wallowing here <laughs> I'm just a glamorous person singing. Yeah. And like she, you know, I was thinking about how like, um, you know, arguably you could make the case that all like systems for organizing human existential experience, past and present religion being the obvious example, but also like duty to the state or duty to the family are on some level like a rationalization for narcissism. Like they let you rationalize your delusion, whether it's self love mm. or self abnegation. But like, I feel like contemporary ideologies differ in one re- important respect because the past ideologies offered people at least the illusion of transcendence of the self, but contemporary ideologies give you this kind of like material legitimacy or urgency to your retreat back into the self. Right. So like, you know, I was thinking about this, like with feminism, there's this like famous line that women make 78 cents to the dollar. I don't know if this is true, but if you follow that to allegedly, level, allegedly, so yeah. we hear not in the media, they don't. Um, but if you, you know, you arrive at this like logical conclusion, uh, which as somebody put it on Twitter today, like it's convinced women that, that abandoning fa- the family was a good idea. Um, though at the end of the day, women lost in the state won. And yeah. that's like all that is. I mean, I think about like I, I've taken the red pill on feminism a long time ago. <laughs> I know. I just it's so coupled in dominant discourse with like just inherent virtue to say you're not a feminist is like trans highly transgressive. It feels, you know. Yeah. But it's well, I mean, not. We, we were. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this on the last episode. Mm -hmm. You can't even say that you're not a feminist because then you seem like a weird, like, gun girl or something. Right. Well, Lana says, let me, let this be clear. I'm not, not a feminist. When I first read it, I thought she said I'm not a feminist. I I got excited. (laughs) No, she's not, not a feminist, but there has to be a place in feminism for women who look and act like me. The kind of woman who says no, but men hear yes. The kind of women who are slated mercilessly for being their authentic, delicate selves. The kind of women who get their own stories and voices taken away from them by stronger women or by men who hate women. A little oh, confused, but I think I get what she's I on sort about. Of, she's like, there has to be a place in feminism for women who look like me that other women are jealous of because I'm <laughs> naturally voluptuous and can also afford plastic surgery to make me look even hotter. <laughs> Who's going to make room in feminism for women who are hot? Yeah. It's and like feminism, delicate. a bunch of blue haired walruses and skinny fat girls <laughs> with septum piercings. <laughs> what about women who are hot, delicate, authentic, artistic, <laughs> beautiful, gorgeous, special, tragic, dark, deep? <laughs> what about us? Okay. What about me? Um, But in a way, she's saying, what about women who are like kind of are maybe melancholic and tapped into this level of femininity that isn't empowering or pleasant or but that still has its own kind of merits and its own kind of power. If you're actually smart, if you're actually smart, you like you would have never entered into this fucking 
rat Co- race to the bottom. bargaining agreement to opt into fucking neoliberal civilization. Like, ew, why? Yeah, to, you, you, like, entered this, uh, according to the tenets of feminism, you entered into this rat race of being a staffer at People or Jezebel so you could practically forego your chances of meeting a man who finds you tolerable and have so replaced you can do that with a dog or a career. cat. Yeah. <laughs> so you can write little fucking shitty articles about why you don't like Red Scare podcasts. <laughs> yeah. No, it's like terrible. God. I mean, sorry. I know we're being literally bitches. No, I know. And I know fuck. that there's probably a lot of people. I'm just going to preempt the haters. There's probably a lot of people who are groaning right now. And we're like, I know these red scare hoes are going to offer their classic Lana take mm-hmm. on this Which is episode. That getting hit by your boyfriend feels good. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't feel good, I'm but just... it makes you feel more alive. <laughs> We're kidding, folks. No, we're kidding, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Eli did restrain me today because I was Ooh, acting a fool. Jealous. Really what were you doing? I was being a crazy, hysterical did he grab bitch. your? Did he grab your wrist? He, he grabbed my shoulders. Wow. Restrained yeah, you. What yeah. were you being... What were you shouting, screaming about, Anna? <laughs> God, I don't remember. Um, it doesn't matter. I'm sure you were drunk. <laughs> I Not... It was in the morning. We had a... The cat did a bad thing. Um, oh, no. Yeah. You like kill, you like killed the cat. No, she's right behind me. Um, I, that would be my like last straw. I couldn't. I couldn't. But like I was saying this on that one episode where uh, we lost the first fifteen minutes of audio uh-huh. um, about how like you know people are always like, oh Anna, you're like uh, normalizing. You're trying to glamorize or condone uh, being hit by a man when it's clear that your boyfriend's too nice and doesn't hit you. I mean, I said this too. I don't want to be with a man who hits me. That's like the no, last. No, that's psycho. Th- we don't want that. We're Jesus Christ. That's the dregs of cuckery. I mean, think about it. Like I said, if you are the type of man who hits a woman in a non-emergency situation, mm-hmm. you have lost <laughs> that battle. In an emergency You're, situation, like she burns the the pot roast. Or no, <laughs> no, like a terrorist attack or like a, a like natural Like she's not ironing disaster. your shirts fast enough. <laughs> sort of. I was thinking more of like a nuclear type scenario know, where she's like, we're going to die. And you're just like, you know, you backhand her a little. You got to slap them to calm them, calm these broads down. Yeah. It used to be normal. I know. But, I hear you. I'm hundred percent on the same page. Anna. But if you, if you, um, <laughs> if you, you know, are the type of man who is capable of hitting a woman, you are an insecure, weak man who does not deserve to be with a woman. That's my you're a take on bitch. it. Yeah, yeah. You're a little bitch. And if you're, yeah. You're that's good. how I, I love hmm. getting restrained and menaced with violence. That's hot. Ooh. That gets the juices of flowing. <laughs> and you know, Lana likes it too. Of course. It's all through her, the, the, the motifs of her songs deal think, with that. With a I, kind of, I mean, Natasha Stagg, I think, she wrote very wonderfully about it as being this, yeah, sort of relationship to powerlessness mm-hmm. that's profound and this kind of innate recklessness of femininity like women don't understand that like yeah they're chaotic yeah they can't assimilate into <laughs> civilization totally but like that and that is kind of their strength yeah it's it is yeah their strength is in their like destructive and chaotic nature as exactly. Jordan Peterson said and Camille Exa- Pablo exactly. said before him. like when I when I when Jordan Peterson harps about that stuff I'm like I get it and I'm like but I just don't I'm, I just don't think it's bad yeah I don't think I don't think he thinks it's bad I think I think he's probably also suing for the same thing that I'm suing for which is that you know again like I said take a long hard look in that selfie mirror and recognize that you're being deceitful about your motives and that you're capable of a lot more evil and chaos and destruction than you think you are. Totally. No, it's, I mean, it's this Nietzschean sort of idea about slave morality, about like herd morality is that these people that like 
libs suffer from in the extreme sense and that you know you because you're oppressed you develop this ideology this relationship to the world where you're inherently good and that the people who are oppressing you are bad because they're powerful right but then so then you can never confront your own kind of evil your own impulses towards power your own impulses towards anything but like an untarnished goodness yeah and it's actually you just cuck yourself yeah you do like at the from the jump wait are you saying that jeffrey epstein was actually kind of a nice guy (laughs) he 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 lorded over people i'm talking yeah I, i mean i'm talking purely like psychologically yeah yeah no i hear you it's mm. I don't think, like, the ruling class is inherently good because they're powerful, like, because they've come to power through wretched means, etc. But I think that, you know, psychologically distancing yourself from power, which feminism has had to do, in the, it has, to, it, it forced women to opt into this victim narrative that ultimately, I think, did them a big disservice. Yeah, I mean they they basically again it's it, it's kind of like an it, it, internal contradiction and incongruity because um, they basically are kind of like sitting between two chairs when it comes to their own agency. Like they're claiming that they want to be treated as equals, but what they're really saying is that they want special treatment. And like right. actually, Gia Tolentino, who we will not be talking about <laughs> at length on this episode is a good example because I think her writing project, like, you know, there's, there, there's a lot of praiseworthy things about her. She's a, she's a good and competent writer. B, she has a really kind of unique knack for seizing on topics that other people didn't know were topics, but that they had kind of at the back of their mind. Yeah. Her Instagram face piece, for example. Yeah, and actually, but you can say to Gia, to Gia Tolentino's credit, she was one of the early mainstream critics of neoliberalism. She mainstreamed neoliberal critique. And, yeah. like, you can, the cynical way of looking at that would be to say, like, oh, well, she took her good ideas from from smarter and better and more obscure people but at the same time like she ha- she alone had the, the the kind of talent and the chutzpah to synthesize it for a mainstream yeah audience. exactly that's valid absolutely that's, yeah that's a virtue but her whole problem the reason that she comes off bad faith as a writer the reason that her project fails is because she's so interested she's in being seen as good and being liked mm-hmm. she doesn't have to do that yeah, I know. She's good the way she is on her own. And she'd be yeah. even stronger if she, like, put her money where her mouth was and, like, issued actual critique instead of, like, beating around the bush. Yeah, I was thinking today when I was, like, stoned and making Spotify playlists about <laughs> how, like, I... And engaging in the in Gia Gate, just how, like... I, me, me and you both are perceived as being like bit bitches and mm-hmm. being mean and being bad. And it's, mm-hmm. and I don't think that either of us are. Like, I think we're both, I'm like, you know, we're both actually nice girls or good Russian girls, but, yes, yeah. <laughs> but the sort of, I do understand, like, I'm not, I don't pretend not to know that I have an affectation of meanness, yeah. but I understand that people are going to hate me anyway, yeah. you know? Yeah. And yeah. like Gia doesn't seem to have grasped that entirely. What do you mean that people are going to hate her anyway? Or Yeah. I don't think so she, that, it's like a defensive kind of like way of leading with being like good. Yeah. That's a good point. I don't know if like, I think the vast majority of people actually like her, which like, um, but if she was honest about, like, Faludi, if she was honest about kind of more uh, complicated parts of herself, you know, that aren't purely good, yeah. then I guess, but in light of every, like, in light of, I don't know, because goodness is connected to, like, deserving your success and your position and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's, I think, why psychologically she's so incapable of relinquishing it. 
Wait, how do you mean? Because if she admits that she's not unequivocally good, it means that she doesn't deserve her success. But, like, sure she does. Exactly. I know. That's what I'm saying. Like, sure, sure she does. She's done the work and she's, like, showed up. And she's literally done the thing that a lot of people can't do, such as myself, which is, like, right. Like, yeah. clock in and clock the fuck out. But, um... A hundred percent of writing is getting the words it's, down. It's like Gorbid all, right? It's typing the words. It's literally <laughs> sitting down and typing the words. There is a great piece that I really should learn to pronounce uh, Paglia's name correctly. Paglia. Paul, you, did I'm you afraid notice she's going to stop making, talking to did me Did you or know something. I was making an effort yes, to say it I noticed, correctly? Yeah. I also want to say Paglia, but it's Paglia. Yes, yeah. Pog. <laughs> Paglia. Pog, we just love Pogs so much. We can't help ourselves. But, um... <laughs> She, you know, she had that essay on, on Gore Vidal's Myra Breckenridge and in it she details how like Gore Vidal would wake up in the morning, like eat breakfast, whatever, do his like calisthenics or whatever people back then did, clock in and mm-hmm. clock out, write for like four or five hours and then go out and cruise for dick. And he was like relentless. He lived in a villa on the Amalfi Coast. It was like Beautiful. the life. I was talking to my I shrink mean, about it and he was like, the sh- my shrink literally said that must be the life. And I was like, Fuck. you shouldn't reveal your innermost thoughts and preferences to me, my dude. Well, I'm paying you. But, uh, <laughs> I'm paying him like $25 Pasolini an hour. Pasolini too. But. Pasolini wrote poetry, toiled on his beautiful films and like sucked dick all day. Yes. But the point is that they had discrete brackets of time when they clocked mm-hmm. into work and then other discrete brackets of time when they like cruised for 17 year old rent boys. Yeah. On the Amalfi Coast. <laughs> and that's the I way know. you have to do it. And like, okay, she I has know. she has like the sheer talent and the work ethic and the, we should stop talking about her now cuz now we're kind of We like, need to save it. Yeah, we need to save it. But um but the problem it, it just in a nutshell with all the kind of women that we critique, we're not trying to like bust their balls or making make them feel less than, but all these chicks like her, Taylor Swift, the countless other kind of liberal PMC f- females we've uh, gently mocked. They have this yuppies. obsession. Yuppies. Well, yeah. What was that thing that you On said? On Donahue, Paglia, Paglia, and various audience members and call-in guests refer to people as yuppies, which I right. think is we should bring back. Yeah, yeah. Like, I, I agree. Yuppie. Young urban professional, like... PMC, professional managerial class, like these are all things that have sort of fallen out of popular parlance. And I think like, no, like there are fucking yuppie, like, sorry, just the Gia thing one more time. Like seeing (laughs) everyone come out in droves to be like, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like those people are yuppies. That's why they they all share the same class interests and are like backing each other up like that because they're yuppies. Well, but this is the thing. It's like, you know, I had the thought, I think I texted this to being a yuppie is no longer a shameful thing. Everybody's a yuppie. We're all yuppie content creators. It's not a slur anymore. Everybody wants to be a yuppie. I know, but it's more than just yuppie is also a state of mind. It is. Yeah. But it's like a a clean buttoned up. It's, it's superior. Like we're technically, young urban professional we're literally yuppies. We're, we're not, not hipsters actually we're yuppies. i mean well the the issues were not quite professional enough because we can't really get it together to get the audio right and yeah send, respond to the sentences and emails and stuff like that but, but you know but in that what I'm, my point is that like being a yuppie is also kind of a state a state of mind Yeah. And I think that hinges on the kind of professional aspect of it. Like careerists, like these people who want, they're not operating in good faith. And just because you're young and urban doesn't mean you, you have to (laughs) be professional. That's true. If you're just young and urban, that means you're black. (laughs) That's, that's the marketing demo. You got to add the P and then, um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think, like, you know, maybe people should start replying to other people as, like, instead of saying, okay, boomer, they can say, like, okay, yuppie or something corny like that. But, like, (laughs) just I I think people should, I think bootlicker should come back. Yes. Which it has a little. And bootlicker and yuppie are things that we should be throwing out more because they are 
richly descriptive of a type that yeah. ought to be ridiculed. Yes, I was I was thinking about this because like you, if you think about like the whole world has basically been yuppified and it's been like normalized like sweet green reformation mm-hmm. all the shit that like Gia Tolentino writes about is basically the triumph of yuppie culture. Yeah, and that's the real sin of gentrification to me isn't that it's you know even though the economic forces behind it are sinister the real the issue is also that the culture this yuppie culture which in modern times is also highly like infantilizing for some reason yeah is what's distinctly disturbing about it is that like not only are you you know displacing people and like r- ripping apart communities you're building like cereal west and like adult playgrounds <laughs> and like places that sell like milkshakes with alcohol and that yeah. like shit that's like so decadent and gross and like just bad it's like the anal phase of <laughs> freud right but you can live your life with dignity you don't have to like opt into this yuppie mentality yeah, so you can eat solid food and wear clothes without an elasticated waist exactly you can suffer a little bit you know it doesn't have to be so easy for you just because you like work at jezebel or whatever (laughs) yeah and i appreciate like lana's commitment to suffering for the craft you know but it's like you know like make no mistake also like she she's in this kind of like impossible situation because she's basically a girl boss pop star mogul Mm -hmm. her fantasy it's like you know quentin crisp said there is no um great dark man Mm. we all wish for a great dark dark man to restrain and dominate us lana can't have that at the end of the day she's surpassed any metric that would make a man like that want to be with her Mm. you know what i mean like she's beautiful and talented and mega rich it's the 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 more kind of self-actualized you get as a female the uh smaller your pool of decent male candidates becomes Mm, I don't know if that's true. No, I think it's certainly true on some level, like, because you're basically... I think that there is... I don't know. But you're basically forced to choose between, like, Olivier Sarkozy, like, well, Becky and banking faggots who are, like, you know, who who are, like, skinny fat with, like, gynecomastia, or... They're powerful. Yeah, they're powerful. I mean, Lana Del Rey has a song, Cola... The song in which she says my pussy tastes like Pepsi Cola is about Harvey Weinstein. Oh, it is? The refrain in it is Harvey's in the sky with diamonds and it's making me crazy and it's all about this like rich, powerful. And like that's, I think that, you know, again, 10 years of Lana standing here. Like I like have, I have have distinct (laughs) opinions about every Lana record. Like I've really like am engaged with her work as an artist and like, uh, you know, early like ten years ago in her career, she was very much doing this like Lolita thing. Mm-hmm. Yes, and, I remember that. And like, she obviously can't do that anymore because she's thirty four or whatever. But she still has, you know. So it's like it's interesting to watch the maturation of that kind of psychology, of that kind of point of view. And then now, yeah, that's why Norman Rockwell doesn't have the same, like, affectation of, like, daddy, dominate me. It's more about just, like, being like, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. And, like, you're just a man and that's what you do, you know. Right. Like, you just can't help. You know, it's, like, it's all very interesting to me as as a perspective. Well, yeah, I, I remember when, like, she came out with, like, video games or whatever and she had this whole, like, Lolita jailbait aesthetic and now mm. she's like the Persian blonde of like that shows up in the kind of like uh, Los Angeles ranch of like a novel of jo- <laughs> John Fonte. She's like a washed up <laughs> aging actress stalking yeah. around a uh, condo complex in a David Lynch movie. And she like embraces this like really beautiful, like ripe, washed up exactly. older female sexuality that Americans totally don't understand. It's like the Monica Bellucci, Anna Magnani, Monica Vitti, yes, Italian that mode. still has the same like desperation that the Lolita stuff does. It's just... Well, yeah, because you started out as a 14-year-old whore who was like anally raped by Roman Polanski <laughs> and then you turn, you end up like a 38-year-old washed up actress whore in in like 
feather <laughs> mules in a in, in a condo in LA and it's the same kind of like desperate craving for male yeah dominance and affection and eventually like that's which are thing. connected to you because of your father mm-hmm. <laughs> and that's the essence of like that's like the thesis of Lana's oove, right? Is yeah. it's like this overarching like dad thing, and yeah. that's valid. And she is the only one to do it. And for people to, I don't know. I'm well, sorry that she feels that she's a you know that people unduly accuse her of glamorizing abuse because I don't think that's what she's doing. I don't think but what she's doing from, at all. I don't think she's a woman who would stand for actual abuse. At the end of the day, she's like way too willful and strong. She this woman's no loser. But yeah, like, she's just fucking, she feels intense, tragic feelings. Yeah, and it's like, the thing is, like, when you're a woman of that ilk, your sexuality never fades away. That's why, uh, like, somebody like Ava, Ala Pugachova, my Avi. Oh, yeah, I know. Platform, of course I know Ala Pugachova. No, I know, but I'm, I'm saying mm. it for the, mm-hmm. the, the fans and the listeners. Okay, that woman is uh, old and disgusting and decrepit. She's still sexy. She's yeah. like she has like a voice like sandpaper dipped in honey. Mhm. She's like a nasty old broad. She's like because she's always been like on that abject tip and she understands like that that female sexuality depends on its submission to male dominance and like male sexuality depends on its submission to female chaos. I know. I was thinking <laughs> that's very well said. I forget what it was that made me think about, um, I was just, oh, I, the, that feeling when no girlfriend, I guess, because we never really talked about it since Camp Camp Bot, but it made me think. We've never talked about how sexy Camp Bot. (laughs) (laughs) I had the objection. Yeah. Um, uh, but I was thinking about how important, like masculinity is in a way that's no longer acknowledged and that liberal feminism is so emasculating it is, in a yeah. way that disregards that completely and like and then we wonder why there's just this rift this like fracture in between in between men and women and like women are don't understand that they're doing men like it's actually an act of incredible grace and kindness not to emasculate men it every is, chance yeah. you get like and that is <laughs> Because masculinity is also, it's not, it has a fragility and it has like, it is fragile. You just, it's, you can't disrespect it because you're going to fucking, you're going to fuck yourself over and you're going to like fracture someone's ego in a way that is makes the future male, female relation impossible. Exactly. They, They depend, they depend on our validation and our esteem Mm-hmm. Yeah, which is again what goes back to what you were saying about like why hitting a woman is so cucked because it's like you're not asserting your dominance in a way you're just it's like you're, you're displaying lashing, your you're lashing, you're lashing out because you under you like understand on a level on a level that you're well, but I'll tell you why because a man's duty is to protect a woman and a child first and foremost. Or there's like a pecking order abuse. The man protects the woman, the woman protects the child. Mm-hmm. The man's duty is to protect the woman, but people people think of that in terms of like outward pulsion. The man's duty is not merely to protect him, the woman from the outside world. It's to protect the woman from himself. If he wow. can't do that, he's failed in his duty as a man <laughs> no i'm sorry i yeah that's no true. i think that's how very astute anna it's true um speaking of that <coughs> P- peter nelson <laughs> who is this mysterious suited man who's ripped the call her daddy girls apart it's clearly an inside job he's clearly manufactured this drama i've been thinking about it more and more well you think- i guess you think he's the one I think yeah if you google him the first thing that comes up is like a New York Post thing that's like who's the man who's in the middle of the call her daddy drama and it's like an article about Peter Nelson who like they never used to write articles about the call her daddy girls until this like scandal quote unquote emerged you know and all of a sudden 
Desperate Everyone, times all this, call for desperate measures. He's, you know, he's an HBO exec. He knows what he's doing. He's generating all this intrigue around the call her daddy girls. I don't know if it's fully an inside job and like if Barstool Sports is getting fucked over or whatever. <laughs> I just what learned if they're all working this shit in, is. I know we literally learned about this today. And um, now I'm like, they're in cahoots. <laughs> Dasha, how does it feel about, how does it feel to be the last dumb horror podcast hosted by a blonde and a brunette standing this is it baby yeah if you want your brain dead blonde brunette duo barstool sports hit <laughs> us up i'll to. work for way less than five hundred thousand or whatever was promised they're like uh sorry we don't hire women with lazy eyes <laughs> <laughs> Somehow you look totally different, but you've both managed to have a lazy eye. How is that possible? <laughs> like it's called being in Chernobyl. <laughs> we're, e- we're Eastern European. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they're not. I had never listened to them, obviously, until this scandal orchestrated by what's his name, Peter, Peter Nelson. All Peter these people Nelson. have such like Wonder Bread white people, like Beaver Cleaver, Picket Fence, Becky names. Uh huh. Alex Cooper, Peter Nelson. <laughs> they sound like they're like, characters in Mad Men. They do, and I don't know the girls last. Sophia and Alex. Yes, are the girls. Alex Cooper, Sophia Franklin. They feel like cousins. When I listened to their pod, I was like, it's annoying. And it sounds, in a way, I was like, wow, this is what people like when they make fun of us, maybe think we sound like. Yes. I was like, like this is like what people like. American cousin with name brand clothing. (laughs) (laughs) Totally. Yeah. We're like off brand, call her daddy. (laughs) We're we're like. We're like Ukrainian black market. Yeah. Call her daddy. Yeah. <laughs> Where we like can't even pronounce stuff right in our jokes. We're like yeah. very poorly. There's like a buzzing sound in the like, background. There's a refrigerator. They're like, this one has a weird mole and the other one is literally trans. <laughs> anyway. Um... No, I have to say, listening to them was a little bit like listening to a more mainstream alternate universe version of us. It fucked me up. Like cousins. I was like, I under spiritually, like we're doing the same thing, kind of. Well, they, I heard one of the episodes I listened to, they were hawking. They got sponsored by Urban Decay. Oh and they God. were talking about how if your boyfriend comes on your face, like the makeup won't come off. <laughs> and yeah, I was like, you use it as a, as a good primer. Semen. <laughs> and they have some kind of thing called like overnight spray that you can like sleep in it. I was like, why no. haven't why don't we have deals like this? Why yeah. are they wheeling and dealing? Like, I just want Mariam Nasser Zadad to sound us to send us some free shoes for the love of God. I know, but she doesn't like that kind of locker room talk. I no, guess. she doesn't. It's like every every fucking bitch <laughs> with hairy armpits and weird eyebrows has an M and Z endorsement. Why not us? I know. We're both size zeros. Because we're fundamentally ostracized for being podcasters because it's low culture. That's true. We don't <laughs> we don't have like a column it's and a, bon it's appetit. It's disgraceful. Or whatever. Yeah. But they were also inspiring because I was like, oh, like they seem like they're good at fucking. They're not like pathetic. No, they're you not. You know, cocked. like sometimes I have a little bit of like shame around being a podcaster mm-hmm. Because it is this kind you know, I'm like, oh, actually, I have a podcast. Like, <laughs> and when people are like, how's your podcast going? I'm like, I don't want to talk about, like, my yeah. media <laughs> podcast or whatever. Or, like, what's your podcast about? Like, I don't want to talk about it like in society because it seems pathetic. But I'm like, no, like, they're cool. Like, <laughs> yeah, they cool. seem like they, they fuck were and boots. they're, like, funny. Yeah, like, they're, like, actually funny. Yeah, I was like, sometimes I have this horrible feeling, like, if I didn't have a boyfriend, I would never get a boyfriend now that I'm a podcaster. Who wants to oh date God. a female podcaster? Well, I bet a lot of people want to date Alex and Sophie. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. But Sophia. it's like, <laughs> but it was really cute because I like listened to an episode. It was them like mispronouncing words like protege. <laughs> they like uncovered the identity of one of their stalkers. They claimed <laughs> to be hung over. And then they said that they did investigative research for you guys, which is like all things that we've literally done. <laughs> 
but I I did some <laughs> investigative research of my own. I listened to the pod so that like, for yeah. once I don't have to feign this whole like who me? I'm like just a dumb bimbo classic like female incompetence whatever. Um and yeah, I listened to it. <laughs> yeah. I tried to like listen, you know, to get a, a better sense for their dynamic and mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. whatever and what they were about. And I specifically didn't listen to the April 8th one, which is the one before they went dark, you know? Okay, yeah. I listened to the one before that because I wanted to get a sense for, like, the authentic yeah. nature, blah, blah, blah. Exactly. But in that episode, to be fair, they do allude to, quote, tension in the home because one of them admitted to journaling her thoughts about the other one, which, like, I would never do. Like, what? Like, I was like, bitch, have you not heard of the Stalin code? First of all, number one, you always get somebody else to try the drugs for you first. So you make sure they're not (laughs) laced with fentanyl. Number two, you you never commit your innermost thoughts about anybody to paper because you never know who's watching. Of course not. You don't write that shit in a diary. Uh Uh-uh. You keep that inside your mind. And the other crazy thing that they do is they talk about making a list of all the guys they fucked, which is like, I was like, what are you, Tracy Amin? Like, why do women write lists of men they fucked? I honestly yeah. like do not remember most it's of something to I've talk talked. about, I guess. But I, I don't. It's I don't have a list, but sometimes I'll remember someone that I forgot about and be like, oh, like yeah. there's another one. Like there is a list somewhere in there. I just I'm not gonna do that. I don't want to relive all those traumas. I don't want to make lists of men. I'm not Moira Donegan. Exactly. I'm not trying to write diaries and Excel spreadsheets of. But no, it's weird because I think about like, I can't even, I've, it's not even like my number is that high. I just like have repressed all but yeah. the last three because it was so bad and drudgerous all the way through. You There's know. a lot for sure that I just tucked away in some corner of my mind and don't need yeah. to at all. <laughs> like ever revisit. It's fine. <laughs> but I, I totally see the point now. I think like I, you learn by example as human beings. We are biologically primed to learn like kind of in a sensory way, not an intellectual way. Mm-hmm. And um, I can totally see what people meant when they said that they couldn't tell their voices apart because I cannot tell their voices yeah, apart. I was like, I know. I was going to ask which one you thought was me and which one you thought was you. I can't tell. There, I feel like there's not even a one to one. I mean, I guess the brunette, it's funny because the brunette looks more like you in the face because she's like kind of cute and Asian. Yeah. You're Asian, but I guess has more my hair. And then the blonde <laughs> kind of has like a large, as like Isabella Blow yeah consolation of features but like that fake blonde weave so i can't tell exactly it's, a, it's like it somebody like scrambled us in like one of those bullet br- blenders and i also had difficulty even though they say each other's names i still had a hard time but it takes a real investment i think and i just and i kind of mixed them up in my head too i like it took me a while to realize that alex was the blonde one and sophia was the brown haired one so it's all scrambled up in there. me too i i always assume that like the brunette has the more tomboy name you know exactly like freaks and geeks or whatever um (laughs) but i i get it like i i was trying to and these are like girl these are like all i respect them and i'm proud of them me too and i hope they get their secure their bag wherever it may be yeah i like them it's Mm -hmm. like you know there are there are basic bitch cousins just like um diamond and silk are fat black cousins (laughs) (laughs) yeah they're more than basic, though. They're not quite, you know, I'm sure there's like some other blonde and brunette pod that's more, even more like tepid and yeah. banal. And it's like. No, but I, when I say like basic or like normie, I don't even mean it as a slur. They're just more mainstream. They have more yeah. popular appeal. And it's like there are girls who wear like shop bop brands and pronounce pink like pink. <laughs> pink. 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 <laughs> pink. <laughs> But like they're cool. I was thinking like I was like literally like these chicks are way smarter than us because they have they run ads for something called Ucora, which is like a UTI prevention drug. So smart. They're like girls. When he tries to slip you a cranberry vodka and then wants to fuck you raw, take Ucora. Prevent that UTI, and I was just like, yeah, yes, makeup yes. for getting your face combed up. Well, when I was like reading about them and seeing it, how they were like marketing themselves as like a sex podcast i was like we do blue humor 
Yeah. You know, we just don't like lead with it. And yes. we'd probably be more successful if we did. Yeah. If we just got dumb, like dumber yeah. and more like. No, seriously, <laughs> people would like us more. If we were dumber and more just like, bah, like. <laughs> I, people would like us more if we were like dumber and one of us was fat. Wow, that would, that would, be would the, truly be that would the be world's the most successful women's podcast. <laughs> Shallow Hell, the podcast. <laughs> but did you listen to the latest one with David Portnoy, the barstool sports guy? Yeah, where he talks about what yeah. happened. I had I had my whole like uh, fucking Julianne Moore Boston accent planned, but then I got too drunk on vodka and blue chili. <laughs> wicked these chicks were wicked wow yeah i was like why is this guy's voice making me so fucking horny because he sounds like steve bannon because he sounds like some fucking jewish mass hole who's mad at me he's like Mm -hmm. ranting and he's mad and like he's hot it's like hot to me and confusing and like my wires get crossed you and know a total lying ass prick he's like people might yeah. know me because i never lie just, dog just is fair dumb. dog is clean he never lies mm-hmm. and i'm just like mm-hmm. you're clear lying through your teeth right now like, oh, we offered them a deal they couldn't refuse and it's like you're literally like stacy abrams begging joe biden for the veep nom you've mm-hmm. been begging these two little sluts to come back to your network mm-hmm. because they run your infrastructure they're the the ones bringing you profit they're making money for you for sure but i bet they are entitled and spoiled and stuff too yeah i'm sure i'm sure women have an outsized sense of how important they are these days they think they can (laughs) negotiate (laughs) bitch you can't you better not make problems because you don't have any leverage here (laughs) Um, but there was there was like a, no. an article by Taylor Lorenz in the New York Times mm-hmm. uh, called "How the Caller Daddy Feud Boiled Over," where she talks about their alleged falling out in these like broader, more kind of interesting terms of like mm-hmm. content creators versus content owners, exactly, and like what happens when the brand of the content creators under contract by a media platform outgrows the parent company's like brand and the balance of power shifts. Right. Um, That's why. Patreon's such a great model. Yeah, honestly, yeah. if you guys aren't subscribed to our Patreon, <laughs> yes, you have you, you get access subscribe. to eighty five exclusive episodes. <laughs> we're gonna leak the same three episodes with Amber and Angela over again until we all die. <laughs> Simon Reynolds, anyone? Oh yeah, that I we could. Why also, not? if you're famous or something and you want to come on the pod. I, don't I mean, know. <laughs> just throwing uh, Gia that Tolentino, out there. the invitation is open. Come on the pod. We will not roast you or mock you. We just want to talk to you in good faith. I'm like actually a fan of her writing. Um, uh, Alex and Sophia. Yeah, Alex and Sophia, you guys should come on. We can do like a bang I'd bros have, type special. Yeah, we could get all <laughs> fucked up and talk about our favorite sex positions or whatever. We can talk about for what are your thoughts on reverse cowgirl are. That's a big topic yeah. here. We're Red Scare podcast, a controversial fave position of mine. Pack your Vera Bradley totes and bring them up into Eli's bring your hot little hot little asses up in here. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah, they look, you can... they look fu- they look fuckable. Everyone on barstool sports that I've heard so far sounds fuckable as hell. <laughs> yeah, it's a barstool sports is a. Uh, organization of fuckable people. No, I don't know that guy. That guy has no, a weird I'm, head. I have no Peter idea Nelson what... also has a weird head. He has like both a, a, those guys a polygon are polygon not... head. Mm-hmm. It's I like wouldn't... a weird polygon. Okay, David Portnoy zero or one on the binary. Mm. He looks like that. He looks like the guy that Eric Stoltz played in the movie where Cher was his mom. Who had the weird facial facial deformity? I don't think I could go there. I would if I was really drunk. Okay, I would take him over the, the boyfriend of Sophia. What's the suit his name? man? The suit man. Peter I don't even, I didn't even write his name down. I wrote Alex Suit BF, which is wrong. I meant Sophia. HBO exec. Portnoy says her lawyer sucks. Oh yeah, I thought that was funny. I thought it was funny when he was like, her lawyer sucks, and then he was also like <laughs> <laughs> talking about some guy who hated him and he said dude looks like a fucking dog of course he hates us 
<laughs> and then he said he, he called him oh my god wait he's such a corny loser he called him he was like <laughs> They call him the suit man. I call him the bad guy from a James Bond movie who's way less smart than he thinks he is. Uh-huh. I was like, what is this, The Departed, you little faggot? <laughs> You're blowing our barstool deal. I know. I know. They're I was going to sell, sell you out. Nagging works. Nagging works. I was going to fucking sell you out to, <laughs> to barstool sports. To David Portnoy because... I was want to fuck. I would fuck him if I was dry. <laughs> like, listen, the other one, she has a micro penis. <laughs> Don't believe that. <laughs> but like, um, he he was on there. He was like, the ship has sailed. It's wicked good. The ship has sailed. It's like you're literally <laughs> begging. You're you're begging for these girls to come back. Yeah. Um, he's like it, the the crazy thing about that that thirty minute spot was that he mm-hmm. he said like I told these other guys from another podcast that we host on our network about how these girls got to keep the IP. Why would you tell a bunch of disgruntled podcasting bros that a bunch of the, the, like a duo of bimbos got to abscond with your like alcohol yeah. and content IP? I know. <laughs> This is this is why feminism sucks because it's torn down the illusion that men are smarter than women that both men and women need to survive. Now we I know. know. Now we I know. know. That's so true. If we could just pretend do assault just <laughs> just pretend. Yeah. Lana's is doing believe. it. Take some romantic solace in your suffering and suck it up. Yeah. It's you know? Just, I want to believe that men are smarter and better and They made stronger. the bridges. Like, they can protect you. They're they... cannier businessmen. It turns out that all they're good for is, like, putting together Ikea furniture. And they're actually not even that good at that because they get overexcited <laughs> and, like, po- like, blow a hole in the <laughs> shitty plywood. Stop. Anna. <laughs> no, men are, can be very helpful. I believe that. I couldn't no, have made my useful. movie without men. That's true. Absolutely. You know, people ask me, how did you do it? How did you write, star, and direct? And it's like, because <laughs> I had a lot of boys around. <laughs> you did. You had a lot of men. like Who handled uh, a lot of stuff for me because they're so nice and helpful. Yeah, they were handling the rigs. Yeah, I like those Good boys. Good God. Nice. They um, were wonderful. But, you know, it's like, basically, they t- the New York Times essentially talks about how, um, I don't even know where I'm going with this anymore because I'm so drunk. You're but, um, drunk. But, but basically, they talk about how <laughs> Caller Daddy was like the crown jewel of the Barstool Sports yeah. podcasting franchise. He says, you think I need them? I'm worth $10 million or he whatever. Says, he says he's worth $100 million. Uh, maybe he is. I don't fucking know. That's the Joe Rogan He's thing too. Joe Rogan sold his pod for a hundred million bucks to Spotify, and yeah, I'm, but that's also shocking to me. Yeah, but that's I have no idea how anything works or how much money is anyone making or how much anything is worth. It's all I'm. It's all speculative. It's all grossly inflated. I mean, the WeWork saga probably told taught exactly. us that. Exactly. But you know, there's now rumors that the girls will maybe potentially go on to host their own competing podcasts on the network. Okay. The idea is that is that he claims that what's the bar stool? Oh, Dave Portnoy. He claims that he offered them um, a series of more and more favorable deals, and he does this in this like very bloviating Boston tone, but basically like shows all his cards. Mm-hmm. And then, like in the meantime, Peter Nelson intervened and, and told Sophia not to buy into it, and Alex wants to go for it. It's all this like, um, yeah. And it it seems suit like man, suit man, yeah. And like Taylor Lorenz makes a pretty interesting point that like uh, ordinarily most traditional uh, publishers and talent would seek to sweep any of this stuff behind the scenes, mm-hmm. but in this case, uh, Barstool has been exploiting this storyline in an almost Trumpian way. Like yeah, the, um, Portnoy did but the this. whole. But that's why I think that it's so plausible that the story was planted in the media by. Yeah, it feels anyway. Kind of like, why is the New York Times right? You know, like I'm like not really. It's not that. 
well this isn't an item okay, well there's two ways to think about it there's one one way you c- i agree with you and you can say like this is like an inside job the other thing is like it's quarantine people are scrambling for content yeah and that's true it's but they didn't say. they hadn't written about call her daddy at all basically until Ever. This but they wouldn't because these are these are different spheres of like the world it's like the call her daddy girls are far more influential and interesting to the vast majority of people than the New York Times is. It's similar to Joe Rogan, which yeah. is why when people were butthurt about his Bernie endorsement, it's like the Joe Rogan Bernie endorsement means way more than whatever the, the New York Times political yeah. endorsement is. But um, totally. Yeah, and it's it's interesting that the, the barstool guy, I mean, I feel like he really does show all his cards because he's so eager to exploit the storyline because these girls have mm-hmm. the ultimate, including going on their pod. Yeah. You know, well, hijacking their pod. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, you know, come I think like, come I hope they should just make a Patreon. <laughs> yeah. They should go on Patreon. They would, they would outperform Chapo for sure. And that's not a dig at Chapo, but they already have a, like a captive audience of like, Right. They would be the I number one. I hope things one. are okay between them. I hope they can work I hope it they out. Reconcile. I can't I'm imagine so ever like have fight. Any... I know I can't imagine fighting with you. It would be oh so Oh my weird. god, never. Um but like <laughs> he... the hubris, but I really th- I just we were both so conflict averse actually and like actually care about each other. Yeah, I would never, you know. I feel like you're my wife. I've said this before. I know. We have this mutual venture, and we love each other, and that's yeah. And our, our horoscope is more compatible than any man that we would ever highly, find. yeah. Um, but <laughs> this also like it made me think of like a kind of bigger like meta conversation that like I'm like desperately trying to pour the last dregs of my Tito's vodka. In I won't, I'm gonna. Could you mind if I go get some and we pause really quick? Yes, pause. Okay. I'm gonna, I will. Okay, I'm not pausing it for real. It's... Did you get your vodka? Yeah, I did. <laughs> um, fuck, I forgot what I was saying. What were we saying? We talking about? Uh, I'll have Eagle. I edit this out. Sophia, um, I forget. But yeah, podcasts uh, being more representative of. Hmm. Um, no, but I was no, I was thinking like of a bigger kind of like meta conversation, of how, uh, basically the only way that like people can listen to cute or sexy women talking boldly and openly in a vulgar manner about sex Mm -hmm. is if it's explicitly couched in humor like if it's self-consciously billed as comedy parody a joke etc um yeah like well that's what's admirable kind of about call her daddy even though it's it's not a comedy podcast. They're not no, comedians. No. It's a sex podcast. Yeah. That happens to be it's not even really funny. It's entertaining in this like other kind of sphere. Yeah. Cuz they're not comedians. I actually well, Dasha, this is like a weird huh. thing. I listened to it and I fully expected to like to find it like fully kind of uninteresting and like whatever. Yeah. But it's actually fun and listenable I know it's barely listenable kind of like us it has moments it has its moments yeah yeah. and maybe it's some yeah maybe it's like some kind of because we're podcasters or like (laughs) I don't know look at it look at it differently but I think I mean I don't think I, I guess if I was on a road trip or something I would listen to it yeah and they're like if i was really desperate but i don't listen to podcasts at all truthfully that's true yeah i don't either it's very hard i'm not sometimes i I get when i'm falling asleep sometimes or like i'll listen to not really or like dan's pod but that's kind of it yeah like periodically but there's no consistent it's hard to listen to anybody else's podcast let alone your own but it's like you know like alex cooper says in this article, Barstool is our idea is our idea of uncensored real female locker room talk, which quite frankly is just as nasty as guy locker room talk. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had no problem explaining our experiences as well as ourselves for our listeners' entertainment. I think female locker room talk is far nastier than male locker room talk. And I would I think, agree with that, yeah. <laughs> I think female like character nature is far nastier than male nature on some level it's kind of our symbolic reparations for being like the physically weaker sex 
What do you mean nature? We're like meaner, more vindictive, more vicious people on the emotional level. You think really? I think so. I think like women are in general. I think women are much less gullible and they're therefore much more cruel. And I think that they take advantage of their reputation as being kind of innocent and gullible. Well, that's what I was talking about with like herd morality. Yeah. Like they have to, because the problem is they're so disingenuous. Like they actually believe that they're good. good. Yeah, and they're not. You know, they really believe that they're like these helpless, oppressed, innocent people. Yeah, which is because they have to, because their whole worldview, their whole persecution complex depends on it. Well, yeah, and I think maybe we have an advantage not because we're like intellectually or genetically superior but because we have this like immigrant experience where all of your preconceived notions and like noble Mm. lies are torn away from you before you're even conscious of them as like a child right and like i don't know i'm totally fully aware of every time i'm being craven or callous or manipulative or vindictive or extortionist Mm -hmm. yeah like you know I know you know like we both know I know yeah Yeah, of course (laughs) I 100% yeah but it's interesting because but in the the thing about knowing which I think a lot of people once you know you can choose not to exactly yeah and like if you don't even acknowledge that you know that you're you can be vindictive you can be cruel then you can't ever do anything to change it yeah then you know? you're just like a, a liberal or gia tolentino that's basically yeah that headspace yeah but this is how basically the mostly male audience or i assume it's a mostly male audience of barstool sports can access their own kind of libid- libidinal curiosity without having to interrogate their own unclean motivations like Interesting. Say more. Well, I think I was thinking about this post from 2012 that I really love uh, from TLP where he called Amy Schumer offers you a look inside your soul. Um, Mm -hmm. And he he elaborates in this way. He says that, like, crucially, the self-censorship is coming not from women or society, but from men themselves. And they have to men perform this kind of process of like psychic externalization to avoid being preemptively or or to preemptively avoid being labeled as like predators or perverts or voyeurs by by women Hmm. which prevents them from having to confront their own kind of internal processes interesting um but like they have to introduce this kind of distancing barrier to indulge their own curiosity about women's views and experiences with sex Right. And they have to pretend it's externally imposed. And women do the same thing. This is a quote from TLP. There is a group of you who will read this and feel enraged by a double standard. In front of men, women get to be sexy, talk about sex, flaunt it. But men can't introduce the topic. They can't ask questions. They can't pursue. They can't even look because then they're labeled as predators. If you're in this group, you don't get it. The censorship doesn't come from women. It comes from you. If you feel like you can't ask her about her sex because you'll sound like a repressed stalker, you are, in fact, a repressed stalker wow yeah and amazing but but on the flip side this arrangement benefits women too because like playing Mm -hmm. dumb is how we insulate ourselves from the internal shame and external criticism we encounter totally and i feel like the internal shame is like literally manifested through external criticism on some level How, how how so like i think that a lot of like the things that women do like post provocative selfies invites external criticism that is really kind of like some Freudian manifestation of our internal shame because we know on some level that we shouldn't be doing this. I mean, do you think Lana on some level understands that, you know, that she's externalizing this perception she has about people misunderstanding her creatively or accusing her of glorifying abuse that actually stems from a kind of her shame. Own compulsive inner voice. Yeah. Yeah, probably on some level because she probably knows she enjoys it and, and resents herself for enjoying it. And it's not through no fault of her own because we've all drank like the Kool-Aid of feminism. 
But women will make right. this like obverse claim that we're oppressed by lowered expectations or double standards or whatever that are imposed on us by men and society. And what we're re- really saying is that like, this is the only way I can avoid confronting my inborn, my innate shame at coming off like a slut or a whore or whatever. And, and then, I really, yeah. And like opening yourself up to external scrutiny. But like the the point of this piece, like in the piece, he uh, it's TLP talking about this interview Amy Schumer at the outset of her career gave on Opie and Anthony, mm-hmm. where she performatively conf- confesses this bizarre dark incident, um, where she and her girlfriends were like hanging out at night. They pile into a cab. They get in the back. She gets in the front, and she gets fingered by the cabbie. Mm-hmm. And she kind of recounts how this man is like sweaty, gross, smelly, not a man that you would ever ordinarily yeah. if you were sane or sober fuck and the long story short of it is that it's not that he forced himself onto her mm-hmm. um, which would make it a proto me too story where she was a victim it's that she took his hand parted her legs and put his finger up her own pussy uh-huh. and she tells the story and like you know the the host is like this is like TLP recounting he's talking about how the host is questioning her in this like very ironically detached mock journalistic way like he's doing it for the fans for entertainment right. value not out of my own morbid curiosity at this like totally. serviceably hot girl telling you how she got a dirty cabbie to finger her on like Houston yeah. Street or whatever right cause then you would be like a horny perv yeah you'd be a loser and a pervert And guess what you are, by the way, to all men listening to this podcast. Well, that's why I think it's so difficult for men to present well online in general. Like, yeah, which is why I've never really taken to Tinder or whatever is because it's like seeing a man on Tinder is just already you're like, you're a horny loser. I can tell you're just some horny fucking like you look at you pretending like you're not horny. Yeah, like, like you're a feminist that's, ally. That's pathetic. Or just even like that you're ca- like a casual photo of you. Like even in the most banal ways, like even if they're not even overtly political, it's like every the internet's for girls and gays. I've said it before. Like men trying to present a version of themselves online is fraught with just opportunities to look like a faggot or a loser or a pervert. <laughs> like those are basically the only like modes of masculinity that are available to men on yeah, the internet. Are, yeah. And it's kind of like, excuse me, the deep web or whatever is for straight guys. The to superficial buy consumer off, uh, web is for girls and gays. That's why, yeah. you know, I tweeted recently about like leftist males being the lowest of the low because they like f- shit post and make these like kind of non committal jokes, but they're actually too cucked to take a sincere position. I stand by that. People got mad at But uh, think about it this way mm-hmm. if you were the wife or girlfriend of one of these men mm-hmm. and you saw him mocking another woman. Oh my God. Like, you know to use the most obvious example somebody like Angela Nagel or Amy Therese like I would be humiliated I would not want to be with that man if he yeah said anything mean if or he was being catty on the internet in any direction not a man or woman yeah I mean I think like if my debate, boyfriend was like I don't know like truly can, getting into it with like people on the internet I would be like I'd be humiliated like I would literally so not the be with a man. Hand, let a girl handle this. This yeah, is for girls and gays. Friends. Like media, it's media. It's that's essentially what social media. What's going on? Anna. I dropped a kombucha cap because I'm so <laughs> wasted. But that's the sense. The social media is media, and me the media industry is sort of the terrain of girls and gays. Sorry. Yeah. No. I, it's true. Men should only participate in this terrain in terms of like making like totally non-committal non-incriminating jokes Mm -hmm. and swapping Chomsky and ideas with their friends you should not be commenting on women or homosexuals as a straight man if if you are please keep it to your fucking self yeah don't even talk about us okay (laughs) but like seriously I think that's a good thing to keep in mind 
That's true. Don't talk about girls or gays. I will say people are going to be like, well, why, why is Campa a friend of the pod? And he comments on women all the blah, time. Blah, 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 blah. But he, I feel like to, to his credit, <laughs> he's doing he, some elaborate, confusing bit that I don't understand as far as I can tell. And to his credit, I feel like that if you truly wanted to debate him, he would probably be open to it. To, he to would debate it on, anyone. Like, on, yes. Well, literally anyone uh, in good faith terms. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but women benefit immensely from this arrangement in the short run. Like in the long run, it practically guarantees like the lowered quality of female comedy and whatever mm-hmm. female content. But in the short run, it really allows a select few of individual women to distinguish themselves in a field to become rich and famous. It's like a mutually beneficial agreement between men mm. and women. Um, and I was thinking about how, like, on the flip side of this, it's like men insulate themselves from unwanted exposure critiques by being anonymous. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, John Berger famously said, like, men look at women and, and women watch themselves being looked at or whatever. Right. And you think of, like, the old fashioned metaphor of, like, a peep show where it's like a bunch of faceless Johns looking at a woman, a naked woman through one sided glass. But on the Internet, this takes an even more extreme form. Um, because it's like men who are like anonymous trolls who mm-hmm. can look at you with immunity and women li- and yeah. women like preemptively doxing and exposing themselves so they can offer themselves up for looking totally with immunity. Like, it's like yeah like really doing intense disclosure yeah preempting all critique so men make themselves anonymous women make themselves hyper visible and show whole and mm-hmm. everybody wins. That's the social bargain. It's a literal con- social contract. Wow. Yeah, that's the real red pill right there. Yeah, yeah. and like what people are like, well, <laughs> women are being constantly... That's brilliant, like, Anna. That's, yeah. Thank you. That's very mm-hmm. sweet. I appreciate it. But like women are always like, oh, but people are going to be like, what the fuck, you stupid bitch? Women are always being, being like harassed and attacked on the internet. Mm. But with the in this type of scenario they get women to are be- being confessional and intense and personal online mm. and men are anonymous yeah yeah because men get to look and women get to watch themselves being looked at that's the mm-hmm. arrangement it's it's a replication of like the original formula but just take responsibility for your fucking desires i know and everyone know. would just everything would be easier if we just lived with what we wanted i know but this is like you know we go through like fucking you take like do like seven years of psychoanalysis or four times a week ridiculous mm-hmm. only men are drawn to this by the way to what psychoanalysis yeah i've never met a woman who wanted to do fucking psychoanalysis four days a week i would you would th- you think about it you would not four days a week you an wouldn't. hour an hour a day yeah yeah i, I would you would okay <laughs> i have a lot of fucking free time <laughs> an hour a day no i think it's a good practice i like i know it's sick it's not it's not psychoanalysis is not about getting better but it no, is it's about, about staying like, the f- same but, yeah, but, but erecting even more elaborate defenses to lie to yourself than others. And it, it's having an interesting time. Yeah. yeah. I is, love yeah. intellectualizing my problems and reasoning them away. I, yeah. You know. And I've had breakthroughs in, even in just kind of more casual, normal therapy. Yeah. I mean, I mean of course. But like... I feel like psychoanalysis, strangely enough, you would think that this is like a, a therapy that would appeal to narcissistic, hysterical, histrionic women, but somehow it appeals to men. It's very weird. Then it's interesting. Or at least yeah. Jewish men. But um, <laughs> no, but people are, people would, could probably make the argument of like, well, you know, women are hyper visible on the internet and they're not anonymous and they get harassed and attacked for it, but they get harassed and attacked with the knowledge that they did nothing wrong you know they never uh-huh. have to confront their own responsibility or shame right. in the matter because there's all these be anonymous wrong. trolls like, right because why oh my god wow totally and that's what because yeah because i haven't even made a real person horny it's some anonymous troll and yeah. I, why wouldn't i get to talk about my abject sexual experiences on a public channel yeah <laughs> 
And then because some horny pervert might be watching. Everyone's so damaged. It's everybody's is so everyone's so fucking up and damaged. Not. And like so, then the only women who are available who will talk. Yeah, you, are desperate talk comedians. You, well, yeah, but it's like I mean. But it's like, think about who who is there to talk brazenly and openly about sex. It's the call me daddy girls. It's us mm-hmm. on a much more uh, kind of marginal scale. It's people like Rachel Sennett who are female comedians. Like yeah. she's literally a comedian. Yeah. Um, and that's that's that because that's the way that that we agree to run talk the social about... contract. Totally, anyway. absolutely. Anyway, should we talk about? Uh, the real daddy joe rogan our one true daddy i just i want to say if those girls if the call me daddy girls were really as based as people said they were they would call their podcast call him daddy not call her daddy i mean it's an it's a cute i know i know i'm just being a little bitch uh i loved when they said um we promise we will never fucking leave you daddy gang (laughs) (laughs) and then they did We'll see. We'll see. More will be revealed. I, I really, hope they're okay. I mean, I respect them. Yeah, I really like them. I hope that they like get. I don't know. I hope they mend their friendship. Yeah, if they've even ruptured their friendship, they yeah, might that be, could be just a orchestrating. Lie. A you know, but no, who knows? I'm the one who's being like naive and gullible. Okay, what did Joe Rogan do? He sold his pod to Spotify for one hundred million dollars. One hundred million dollars. Wow. It seems yeah, that's a lot. But he's the most popular person in the world, so I can't tell if he made a bad deal or not. I don't know. He actually is the most popular person in the world. (laughs) He's the most popular person in the world. He's really overtaken Hitler. And he's we're so lucky. We're so lucky to have Joe Rogan. We're so lucky that the most popular person in the world it actually inspire it inspires like (laughs) populist feelings in me because like Rogan is super chill he's like curious he's like i truly think he's like a good person he is a good who's person, like yeah. actually legitimately curious about things in an appropriate non-pathological way and like great like good for him but i don't know i wish that i wish he would start like a podcast network or something and not just like sell out to spotify because spotify's seems Sucks. murky like i got logged out of my spotify the other day and then <laughs> i couldn't it was like some hotmail account that i didn't use anymore and i was like i'll never get it back i had to talk to like a chat person it was the account you know? that you used when you were getting sex trafficked <laughs> yeah and i was trying to make some playlists and i felt you know I felt cucked when I didn't have access to it because I was like, oh, fuck, like all of my every all the music I listen. I listen to music a lot. And it's like all this app like controls it completely. And that doesn't seem so good. But yeah, it's fuck. I don't listen to music. You listen to music. <laughs> <laughs> I know I listen to music a lot, too. It sucks. It's like I'm dependent on on this like yeah shitty platform but he okay so he struck an exclusive multi-year deal he did the opposite of what alex and sophia did which is Hmm. going from independent to contractor and he's like i'm no i'm not an employee or whatever but he he said he so he told his he has 9.5 million or million followers on instagram wow i don't know what that translates to i wonder what his listenership is for joe rogan podcast as it exists I don't know. I don't even know what our listenership is because I, I haven't looked it's like at five thousand people. I, I can barely use a. Comp- I think it's like twenty thousand. Three hundred people. But that was. I haven't. Lo- <laughs> but I haven't looked in a long time, and I don't know. I'm just like stupid, and I can barely use a computer, I so I don't. I know you can't. You can't look at a screen for that long. You can't use two monitors at once. I, am, I have to, yeah, I don't know. Um, we definitely have more listeners than people we went to high school with. That's cool. It's more than whatever the population of our high school was. That's how I like. I went to a pretty small high school too. So that's. Yeah, I went to, uh, mine was 2000 people. That's okay. No yeah, joke. we had definitely have more than that. Yeah. 
Our Patreon has like 6,000 or 5,000. I don't know. That's a good question. Whatever. We should wrap this up. It's all yeah. been, it's been an hour and a half. <laughs> oh, yeah, it has. But no, Spotify has 286 million users. Um, but mm-hmm. no, there's Spotify is doing like this very obvious thing where they're, they cornered the music market and still lost money. And now they, cor- they're trying to corner the podcast market and still lose money. But like, yeah, they're just losing. I don't understand. Well, Joe it Rogan stands like, to make a, a lot of money from this. If the deals in fact work. Cause right now he makes his, all of his money from ads. I guess. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how much he's making. Um, but it's funny. Like I listen, I don't want to like. Ruin He's clearly making, a you ton know, of money. a ton of money, but in like so much that a hundred million dollars is how much it takes to buy him out to buy his pod. You know, well, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. He's, because you would think that he'd be making enough money that this wouldn't influence. How much decision. Anna, how much would you sell the pod for? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. It's hard. I don't I mean, know. Okay. The way I feel about it is that we're still a mill. That's I, not even that. That's not that much money, though. Exactly. Like for us to split, like a mill. Like Dasha, but I, I honestly feel like we could each make a million independently if we worked hard in the next two years. You think? Yeah, absolutely. I don't think that we need to sell the pod for that. A hundred mil, I would consider. Thirty mil, I would 100 consider. Mil. A hundred mil. A million yeah. dollars. Thirty, mi- 30 mil. Thirty mil for sure. I would consider. <laughs> But like a million dollars is jack shit. It's not. It's not even a, enough money to put a down payment on a decent home. Just kidding. But like, it, but it's funny no, because Rogan has been. It's a lot of money. In, yeah. on, in these uncertain times, I'm just you know I'm entering into like a weaselly Russian mentality where I'm like in these uncertain times, like what am I gonna do? You know, if shit really hits the fan. I mean. I don't know. I think it's like, it's the wild West. Like anything can happen, but, um, (laughs) Rogan, you know, he's been denounced by everybody for like doing all these supposedly objectionable things. Like supposedly he's a transphobe and a Nazi and supposedly ruined Bernie's chances of winning. But the reality is like on an optics level, the most objectionable thing he's ever done so far is this deal. And I get it. They've made him an offer he can't refuse. It's a lot of money. Yeah. But I'm just curious. Like, I guess my question for Rogan in, like, straight up good faith is, okay, like, his whole brand is being an everyman and an independent. It's the same question Mm -hmm. I would have for, like, Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos. How much money is enough? Like, how much money do do you need? You're already, like, rich as hell. You're not going to run for president. Mm -hmm. You can more than support your family. Yeah why yeah why joey why why no i know and spotify doesn't treat artists fairly no they're a very you know and i as someone who uses spotify because i just don't have a choice because i'm a fucking american female retard and i can't like (laughs) you know it's became convenient i've been using it for a long time and it's just that's the thing that i do now and whatever (laughs) but why joe yeah at two brutus i mean i hope that he gets so fucking rich podcaster to podcaster yeah podcaster to podcaster joe (laughs) i challenge you to have us on your podcast yeah just and mansplain son. <laughs> why but like i hope he i hope joe rogan i just like i can't help but like joe rogan i've always liked him he's cool he's, so cute he's and cool. like truly innocent in a way <laughs> and hot That's, and hot um, and just like he's yeah where's he from um he he's from boston yeah he's just <laughs> he's a mass hole he's a mass hole i love a mass hole we love mass holes but i hope he gets so rich that he buys spotify and makes all of those people his serfs and throws them into a gulag and then like rides through the streets of america and throws money at <laughs> podcasters and also average people i hope that that's what he's doing but i strongly doubt that that's what's going on i know it's too brute 
We'll see. I don't know. In these uncertain times, though, I feel, you know, you can't be blamed for making, like, decisions like that, I think. Yeah, I mean, I I understand why somebody would want to take $100 million, but I feel like it's Joe so Rogan just, must... Yeah. must like, you know, if he kept doing his podcast, he'd have a hundred million dollars anyway, right? He could right? start a podcast network. Is yeah. With, you know, like he could just with very minimal effort, like incorporate other podcasts that would make him money. That like would, us. He would bo- like, like us. And he would boost us. And then <laughs> he, we would give him credibility and it would all be a nice symbiotic relationship. Yeah, he should start his own. <laughs> podcast network we're uh, such whores we're such whores Anna. i know <laughs> a shameless double dealing two times i prostitutes. know um he just got <laughs> a podcast called like boston at least whores are honest about network. their motivations wait what at least whores are honest about their yeah, motivations yeah, they, yes yeah and they motivate people but no he should start a podcast <laughs> network called like um boston sports and he can hire us to host a new <laughs> podcast that is called like Call Her Fatty or something. Or we fat shame. Call, call Her Fatty. <laughs> and we can be slightly more like wonky eyed and trans than those other two, but it's okay because it's Joe Rogan. Everything has like kind of like soft lighting. It's a little, it's more Gen X y over there. Yeah. We could do our, our, our sick, sad world thing over yeah. there. We could call it Six Sun World. That's true. <laughs> Ghost World. <laughs> Truly. Well, <laughs> I guess we should. Are you stoned? Should. Yeah. Okay. I was, did you see me smoking yeah, weed did, yeah. dirt while we were talking? Yeah. <laughs> Joe Rogan. He likes to smoke weed. Yeah. I'll get into. I all I want is a deal with the. With the Joe Rogan Pod Network and a, my own isolation tank. Me too. <laughs> and or go an accumulator. I want a Faustian bargain <laughs> with the Joe Rogan Podcasting. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, if we sp- sometimes we speak things into reality, like yeah, you know, complaining about fashion from Rachel Comey to Joe Rogan, how two Russian whores <laughs> game the system and. and don't give it to many of our KGB secrets away. No. Okay. Anyway. All see right. you in hell. We'll see you in hell.